speaker is Eric Little. Again, Eric, thanks for uh, agreeing to give this talk at such a short notice. Eric is the Vice President of Data Sciences for uh, OSTHUS. I don't know how you pronounce that, maybe OSTHUS. And yes. uh, the talk that Olivier has given actually is a nice segue into Eric's talk because Eric is also going to talk about uh, uh, use of uh, semantics mm -hmm. for integration of uh, uh, various uh, laboratory data. If I am right, Eric. Why don't Eric, go ahead. Yeah, that's correct. Hi. Um, yeah. So uh, I know several of the people on the call. Um, it's not everyone, but um, right. Uh, I I worked with some of you back when I was an academic, and uh, now I'm working for Austus. Austus is a, uh, a German based company in Aachen, Germany, but um, we have a development team in China. We have a new development team, two development teams in India, and we now have Office Inc., which is the U.S. Um, group that uh, I'm heading up. Um, our research team here is located in uh, Melbourne, Florida, um, but we have some people now out on the West Coast and so on. So we pretty much serve the pharmaceutical and um, CRO and biotech industry. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about today is a, um, a, a very interesting project um, that's going on uh, called the Allotrope Foundation, and you can find that at www.allotrope.org. Um, I'll, I'll put that in. I'll put that up on the chat in a second when I'm done talking. Um, the reason Allotrope is interesting is that it is a consortium. <coughs> is run um, and funded actually through the pharma companies. So what's the problem normally when you start these consortia? It's that nobody takes ownership, nobody actually puts any money into these things, and so there's a lot of talk in conferences and then nothing actually gets done. Um, Allotrope is different. Uh, there's an organization membership fee, so these companies pay in a fairly decent amount of money. I believe there are currently I'm thinking I, uh, I think there's somewhere between 13 and 16 allotrope members now. I'd have to count. It changes from time to time. But these include GlaxoSmithKline, Bristol-Myers Squibb, um, Bayer, Eli Lilly, and a host of other ones. Um, so anyway, the, the group is growing, and the um, idea here is if you look at slide two, it's breaking us out of this current lab situation. So what happens in your average pharmaceutical laboratory is that you wind up with people, a lot of individuals whose desktops look like the top right picture. In other words, they have a ton of their information sitting in their own Excel spreadsheets. It's not searchable uh, in the enterprise. It's very rarely shareable. It's usually written down in someone's own private language, um, and it contains a lot of useful information. So what this does in the pharma industry, of course, and I don't think this is news to anyone, um, it develops data silos, um, and it makes it hard to exchange information. This is exacerbated, of course, by the fact that the companies um, like Agilent and BioVia and Thermo and so on and so on um, sell instruments to these laboratories that also run on proprietary information. So a lot of the vendor's tools don't talk to one another, so your mass spectrometer won't talk to your weighing device or your microscope. So even within a laboratory, you have multiple instruments that you can't even move the data around with. So everyone is downloading things and dumping it into Excel. Um, so you have incompatible instruments. Um, there are lots of legacy architectures that exist, so you have all of these attempts at databasing this information Perhaps some people have built some data warehouses. These tend to be brittle and rigid. Um, you have a lot of SME knowledge, therefore, that's residing in people's heads. So to get any of this done, you actually normally have to have people doing the, the querying and the heavy lifting. So a lot of what is supposed to be done by things like ontologies are actually happening by individuals. Um, the data schemas are also not explicitly understood if you go into these companies. Um, people in different groups have different data schemas that often compete. Um, and there's really a lack of a common vision then between the business units and what goes on in the sciences. So people at the uh, top levels of these companies are actually looking for um, information to make go-no-go -go decisions on drugs or to um, better understand their portfolio. And it's hard to get that information out of the labs. So real quickly to the next 
slide because I like to speak about things that matter for these companies as well as just the technology. Um, why does this matter for these businesses? Well, enterprise systems are increasingly becoming hybrid in their design and their natures. And what I mean by hybrid is that they're containing lots of uh, different types of technology now. So uh, more and more people are looking to uh, integrate their relational systems into ontologies, but they also want to bring in social media um, data and integrate that into their ontologies. And then people are looking to do things with NoSQL and data lakes, which have nothing to do with ontologies. So you now have uh, this new wave of, of, um, of databases springing up with things like uh, Hadoop, which is, you know, some people would say is already dead and is going to be replaced by Spark. I'm not sure if that's really true, but you get the gist. Um, these legacy data sources are really getting combined a lot with new technology. Um, so this is really what slide three is about. And it's meant to show people um, this, this one, uh, what I think is kind of a um, uh, provocative statement to make to people in these organizations. And it's under the third bullet point, namely that data, I think, is now the most valuable corporate asset that these uh, people have. So um, we spend a lot of time looking at the IP around um, compounds and around biologics and around products. But the ability to utilize your data to ship those products so that you can get new items in your pipeline faster, um, that you can understand your IP quicker, um, that you're able to scan and um, respond fast to environmental influences that could lead to things like uh, FDA audits or that could lead to, um, you know, God forbid, in the farm industry, uh, something like a product recall. Um, this is really important. So the ability to use data is, is ever increasing, and therefore I would argue that the fundamentals of data management have really changed. So we've moved away from the 80s and the 90s, which was about basic storage and retrieval problems, and now we're seeing things, especially with the rise of the Internet of Things, a lot of um, push towards analytics and responsiveness, and by responsiveness I mean real-time uh, uh, kind of processing or near real-time kind of decision-making as close to real-time as you can get it. So slide four shows you a little bit of the structure of Allotrope. And what's interesting about Allotrope is that if you look at this, see that um, the common ontology top level is, is, this is a very basic breakdown just to show people that there are uh, physical objects, there are process objects, and then there are information entities. And any of those, any of those of you familiar with um, the basic formal ontology and some of the work that's come out of Buffalo, Buffalo um, you'll see that this is in alignment with that kind of thinking, um, but it's a much more lightweight version. So we're not really using the full uh, machinery of BFO because we don't need all of that massive classification. Um, but the, the general idea here is separate your spatial things from your temporal things because of parthood um, and uh, uh, put your information objects, which are, are not really like table and chair kind of objects in another spot, but they're, they're all in the ontology. So the main domain ontologies that we're dealing with in Allotrope, and, and this is just taxonomic work, is around equipment. Um, it's around materials, it's around processes, and it's around things like result sets or the, the, the information that comes out of these experiments. And so you can see here at the bottom, you know, the, the, the type of reading you get out of a math spec um, that shows the, the type of raw data that scientists deal with, and we're capturing and classifying that type of information um, into these ontologies to use data laboratory. Um, so slide five really shows you uh, kind of the flow of how these things work. Um, the pink box on top shows the allotrope. <laughs> the phone is on. Um, the allotrope focus varies, of course, from customer to customer. So some people are building converters, um, and some people are building taxonomies. I'm going to say something about that for a moment. Um, in Allotrope, the key here is it started with a basic question. Sorry? Hello? I'm sorry. We don't need any of your products. Bye-bye. 
Uh, I just want to advise people to uh, mute themselves, please. So, um, okay. Um, in Allotrope, what the focus is was this question around why is it so easy to exchange music? Now, it's so difficult to exchange and when we look at music, we said, okay, well, the thing that's interesting that happened in the music industry was people came up with MP3 or now MP4 files, and you were able to, therefore, with any device, buy a song on Amazon or buy a song on iTunes or buy a song wherever you'd like, and you could play it on an Android phone, on an iPhone, you could play it on your desktop, your laptop, your, your tablet, your iPad, whatever. And it also came along with all of the interesting metadata around it. So you get the artist and the uh, year it was uh, created and who the songwriter was and the album artwork and so on and so on. So you get this nice metadata with it. So the goal of Allotrope was why don't we just turn data in the labs into this type of data like we have for music. So that's kind of the underlying uh, idea. So along with the taxonomies, what I want to stress here is that Allotrope is also about creating a common file format called .adf, which stands for the Allotrope Data Format. And so currently with many of the customers, we're building converters so that we can take information off of, off of uh, uh, a vendor's uh, tool set and put APIs and wrappers around it so that we can take the information in this native language that they have, this proprietary language, and turn it into an ADF file format. Um, uh, the folks at Bayer um, uh, have some very nice uh, examples of how they've done this and um, the kinds of uh, savings they've seen in their lab. So what we do is we basically start with, in this sense, the data. And we extract out terms and we look at things like, you know, instruments, drugs, whatever. Um, from the terms, we build controlled vocabularies. From the controlled vocabularies, we build taxonomies. The taxonomies can be of different kinds. Some of them are real taxonomies. In other words, they're just acyclical tree graphs that have is a relations. Some people want taxonomies that are more like WordNet taxonomies where they're a stock model. In other words, you have a term and it says, well, I've got some broader or narrower terms related to this. So it's not really an acyclical tree graph. Um, but that doesn't matter. So taxonomy is taxonomy, however you'd like to build it. From there, we can build thesauri where you get these things like preferred labels and synonyms. So this way, um, we give everything a preferred label, then we give uh, it a whole bunch of alternate labels. So when you're querying and searching, um, you can use any of those terms, and the semantic system is smart enough to bring back all the appropriate results. Um, we store this, for the most part, in RDF models. And so, of course, you have triples in there as graphs. Um, and there's a variety of triple stores that we use uh, to put these things in. Um, and that's kind of where allotrope stops, but where we continue is then we are with several clients starting to look at how you take this open um, set of taxonomies, which are, again, fairly basic, and these converters off of the instruments, and then building more interesting things, uh, similar more to what um, um, the, the two other speakers were talking about. So here we're able to then build real owl ontologies um, where we can add in axioms, we can put constraints on things. Um, we can uh, define domains and so on, and that ultimately leads us to the ability to build reasoning. So we can use rule-based logics um, like, you know, DL reasoners or first-order logic reasoners or whatever, and we can then discover new patterns. Beyond this, what I'm going to talk about next then is, is kind of um, what I think is the, is the future of where all of this technology goes, and it's that you really need to extend semantics now um, to include things like analytics and types of automated reasoning that are not necessarily even logical uh, or logic-based, um, but can be more, more mathematical. And this comes out of my, my, my work I did for many years in data fusion. So slide six shows that we're moving from semantics now to big data analytics. The reason is that semantics... Yeah, Eric, about five minutes. Okay. Semantics is not done well with big data. Um, we're not looking to move everything into graphs and then try to do these really hard computes with massive triple stores. Uh, instead, we are also integrating a lot of work with uh, mathematics. So if you look at seven, slide seven, um, the reason that analytics is important is this old um, 
fable that Ray Kurzweil picked up, and some of you may know about this, it's called the, the second half of the chessboard. Um, so there was a, uh, there's a, there's a, an old fable about um, a peasant goes to the local uh, king or emperor. Um, it, the emperor gives him a task and says, I'd like you to do this for me. And for payment, he says, fine, I tell you what, um, put a grain of rice on, on the first square of the chess, check, checkboard and then just multiply, double that grain of rice. Um, so one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and so on. And so the emperor thinks, well, what a great deal. Um, I'm going to get this done pretty cheaply. Um, and so, but he realizes once he gets to the second half of the chessboard and you start doubling those large numbers, um, by the time you get to the last square, right, you wind up with 2 to the 63rd power. Um, and so you really wind up with 461 billion metric tons minus 100 tons of rice, which is uh, larger than uh, Mount Everest and about 1,000 times the global production of rice in 2010. So what that means is that is that at the second half of the chessboard, you, you hit this tipping point where this doubling effect um, uh, really matters. So a lot of people were concerned with this kind of problem for many years um, pertaining to, you know, Moore's law about, well, we have to keep doubling processor growth. But really that's not what's happened. Um, from 88 to 2003, computer processing speed only grew by about 1,000x, whereas um, during the same period, algorithm speed grew by 43,000x. So algorithms are growing at a rate of 43 to 1 in terms of how fast the processing speed is going. Um, so that tells me that the direction we're headed is not in terms of faster chips and bigger hard drives and things. Storage is almost unlimited. Um, chips are already pretty fast. What this is uh, leading to, though, is the ability to do new kinds of algorithms um, beyond just uh, semantic things. So if you go to the next slide, slide eight, here you see your common breakdown of the four Vs of big data. I know some people have many more. I've seen up to nine. But really, you know, most people in big data are talking volume and velocity. On the left side, semantics is nice for adding the variety. When you have lots of different data types, you want to define these things. You want to be able to connect these things and reason across them. But the veracity piece is a real challenge because uh, ontologies don't really deal well with probabilities. And Kathy Lasky and some other people for a long time were working on this stuff. But it was, it was, I always argued that was, that was, that was laid on top of the ontologies when you start putting probabilities in. So currently we do stuff with graph theory, but it's not semantic graphs. It's having to do with mathematical clustering techniques where we find pockets of information statistically and then we put these semantics on those subgraphs where they can operate much faster and you get really nice um, scalability. So the last slide I've got here is basically just a rundown out of allotropes plus the other kind of work we're doing in the pharma space. Um, this is where I think 21st century labs are headed. Um, they need to provide customers with integrated data, like Olivier was just talking about. So you need common reference data structures and vocabularies so you can combine things. You need shareable data so you have easier interaction across teams and business units so you can find things. Scalability is a big problem because the data is growing and the applications have to be highly elastic. Um, you need good conceptual representation, so things like context and perspective are really important in the scientific community. And you have to have advanced analytics to solve really complex and you have to, uh, problems, and you have to automate many of those problem-solving capabilities. So um, I'll take some questions at the end then. Thank